What's going on, everybody? Welcome to a very special episode of Fun Bros Food. Today, we are on the Lower East Side. We're gonna be touring some Black-owned businesses because after all, it is February, it's Lunar New Year, and Black History Month. Who better to join us to do it but comedian Charles McBee. What up? What's going on? What's going on, my guy? Yeah, I mean, uh, real quick, tell them who you are because obviously you've performed all over, That's Comedy right. Cellar, The Stand, you've been a professional comedian for quite some time. Also the head writer uh, on Charlemagne's Hell of a Week. Yeah, Hell of a Week on Comedy Central, executive produced by Stephen Colbert. Uh, we were nominated for a WGA award. Just been just been doing the damn thing, man. Stand up, writing, TV, acting, the whole nine. Hey man, it's Black History Month. Black History Month, baby. It's, it's Lunar New Year. Lunar New Year. Black Asian Fusion, baby, let's do it. Rush Hour, let's do it. All right, so this is dope because um, I know you just came from Harlem, right? Yeah. And uh, did you know, I mean, the LES to me is really cool because it's almost like a hybrid of everything. Right, right. We're Right now we're at Pig and Butter. Um, Right here, you can see black-owned restaurant. Black-owned, baby. Yeah, let's let's talk to Sherry. Let's do it. What's up? Hey, how are you? How Sherry. is everything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to see you. We actually filmed here a few years ago, right when they opened. Now they got a bar open on uh, Avenue B in Alphabet City. So, man, we're excited to try some stuff. Avenue B for black-owned. Yeah. <laughs> Pig and butter. I'm super excited to try. They actually have like fusion. I want to say the food here. It's almost like soul food fusion. Nice. Yeah, I want to do it. Yeah. I want to get into it. No, I can see. Like, I would say that that just that amount of bacon just right there. Boom. You already know. You, know. you already know what it is. <laughs> listen, for all my Muslim brothers and sisters, listen. Hey, I know y'all don't get down, but I'm about to get down <laughs> on that right there. Yeah. This is like the essence of fusion. Yo, I love it. Where, I love where it. are you starting off with? I'm going here, right? You know here. what? I'm gonna just go ahead and get some of this, this like orange chicken and waffles. Yeah. Have you ever had that before? No, orange chicken and waffles? Nah, chicken and waffles, absolutely. And you had orange chicken. This is like... Because you're from like Toledo, Ohio, right? Toledo, Ohio. Were, were you shocked at how much like Chinese food is eaten in New York? Like, and it's like everybody, like white people got their Chinese spots, yeah. black people got their Chinese, like everybody has their own. Uh, Spanish people got the Chino Latino spots. Yo, you come, you come to New York City, especially from where I'm from in Toledo, because it's kind of, it, it was very segregated. It was like white people, one side, black people on the other side of the city. And there's no other races. There's no other races for real. Like you might see, I had one Asian friend in high school. And, that, and, and they were not adopted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't until I came to New York, I was just like, oh wow, this is what they say, this is what they mean when they say melting pot. Right, right, right. And you dating some Asian women? What? Uh, listen, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I've dated a couple. I got some of your jokes that I want to go over. Yeah. As we eat, you have a joke about how everybody is just better at everything online. I feel like no one ever keeps the same energy nope. online as they do in real life. Mm. So like mm. when it comes to Twitter, everybody's more gangster, more woke, more spiritual, more <laughs> whatever, more better, more, more, better, <laughs> more yeah. everything, right. right? Like everybody is a better person online. Everybody's more gangster online. Everybody's yeah. Everything online. Everybody's the version that they wish they was in real life online, whether right. it's good or bad. Like it makes no difference. But like you get to be not your authentic self because it because it's a different version. But you get to be like your avatar version of you. Right. Either you have so much power that you don't think that there's any consequences, or you have complete anonymity, so you could just do whatever and not get that, caught. That being said, what do you think about the comment section of Instagram of? All these Instagram tends to be a little bit more real because it's more tied sometimes yeah. to your actual profile. Yeah. And people can go in and roast you. And that, that, that's always an interesting to see, same thing to see in the Instagram section. Yo, I feel like Instagram, I don't know, my Instagram comments aren't as crazy. Sometimes they can get crazy, but they, a lot of it is just people that are kind of on the same page of what I'm putting out. But on Twitter, that's where it gets crazy. Because oh. I'll be a little more political. I'll be a little more right. like, because I'm commenting on what's <clears throat> trending or whatever. Like, why? What, what do you think of that? Like, how everything turned into a race war in the comment section nowadays? Is that reflective of the environment? Or, like you said, it's people just engaging in something that would be taboo at work, yeah. not HR acceptable, right? The more uh, mm -hmm. polarized we become in real life, and the more PC, and the more we're unable to, like, just have conversations and say certain things or, or worried about getting canceled in, in regular life, the more people are just gonna be that much, you know, at eyes and, and, and saying that wild, crazy shit. 
online in the comment section. Right, so whether right, it be right. race, whether it be <clears throat> politics, whether it be men and women's, you know, sex, all that. Because right. you can't have, there's no more conversations no more. Right, there's right. There's no that, more nuance, there's no more gray area, everybody just. Is, is that why the comment section on any WNBA highlight is like, oh my get God. back in the kitchen? Oh my God, <laughs> like, it's crazy, bro. Right, right, right. So you talk a lot about that. I feel like you have a lot of really nuanced, insightful takes on sort of like everyday things that people might overlook, right? Because people are not even thinking about how the comment section is reflective of potentially how restrictive everyday IRL society is becoming, right. right? Yeah. What What do you think influenced your ability to like sort of suss out those insights where even your average comedian is a little bit like, they're going, you know, cause there's some hot button issues that it's almost easy to attack. Yeah. But versus you're almost like sussing out another layer um, that the people overlook. But that's just the thing. That's that's kind of a thing that I do on purpose. Like I'll go, okay, what's my immediate kind of gut reaction mm -hmm. to this? Or whether it's the joke. Cause I, don't, I really don't look for the joke first. I look for like, what's my honest take on it? Or what's my like spin on it? But then I go, is this, hacked or is this been done or is this easy like how easy is this is there another angle that i can look at with this whatever the take is say i'll just use politics for example if i'm from a democrat side of or a liberal side of the angle of it i don't want to just look like some liberal on stage just talking 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 i'm i'm gonna be like but what would a conservative say about this or what would if i'm talking from a man's perspective what would a woman's perspective be or what you know saying what would her angle be and i try to find that nuance so it's not just me Cause sometimes a comic could be just on stage on a like pool on a what is it like soapbox or something like that, and I, I never want to come across. You no, know, like they that. come across as almost like a PR rep for yeah. a, for a political side. Yeah, you know, like yeah, a, like yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a funny brochure. Yeah. Tagline writer. Yeah, and that's how you get clapter instead of laughter, because people just be in the audience just doing this the whole time in the grin, but you don't hear no gut belly laughs. I want laughs. I don't give a shit if you agree with me or not. I want you to laugh hard. Yeah. And I feel like. You know, whether you agree with his political leanings or his perceived political leanings or not, that's why like Shane Gillis is so popular oh, right now because he's like getting laughs. Actual laughs. People right. are watching like, what the hell is this? Is this laughs coming through? Like it used to be where you could watch a special and it felt special. It felt like you was watching like, like you was hearing some shit that you didn't, you felt like, oh man, am I allowed to even hear this? You know what I mean? Right. And now, other, now it's start, like you said with Shane and people like that, it's coming back around. But for a long time, it was just people just saying talking points of what they, of whatever it was, was, or being safe. Can you talk about this one joke where you said, uh, I'm biracial, and then you took a long pause. We'll just play the clip right now. It was weird, man, it was weird growing up because like, uh, I, I come from a small town and it used to be hard for me to fit in with other kids, especially other black kids in my neighborhood. Mostly because I'm biracial. I mean, both my parents are black, but I listen to Coldplay, so I'm trying to say like that is. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, um, that was a joke basically where his commenting on that whole like, oh, you not black if X, Y, Z. Right. Oh, you listen to this, you not really black. Oh, you like to do this, you not really black. I came up, I call myself a cul-de-sac Negro. Like, I grew up in the suburbs, but I, like, when I was young, young, we was in the hood. But parents was like, this, this shit is getting crazy. Moved to the suburbs. And then I, you know, ended up being around kids that I wasn't used to being around when I was younger. In my teenage years, like, okay, what's this? What's going on? What is hacky sack? What is that? What are y'all doing? <laughs> right. What's going on <laughs> yeah, here? It's funny hacky. Because this, so, this is like more suburban Ohio. Suburban, which yeah. Which is more like Abercrombie. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I went from, yeah, exactly. From, went from like LeBron James, like Akron <laughs> to <laughs> yeah, 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 Abercrombie. Yeah, exactly. So I had both, I had both worlds to pull from. Certain things I was peeping, like, you know what? I actually kind of like Guns N' Roses. Like, this is kind of hard right here. Or I actually kind of like Nirvana. Like, this is dope. But sometimes you go back to the hood or you go back to some of your old friends and they like, what the hell is, what is this? What are you on? Like, what, is, what are you talking about? Right, like, oh, that's why you on that white white people shit. So that's just a joke that kind of played into, played into that whole kind of narrative of right. just like thick people trying to put you in a, in a certain box when, being black is being black, but like sometimes, it, sometimes it don't be other people. It don't be white people. Sometimes, sometimes it be your own people that try, try to, to put you put you back in the box, back right? in the, into some box. I feel like there's no right or wrong when it comes to a person's personal lifestyle or life choice or who they are as a person. I'm I'm of the belief that every individual person has a right to live their life as they see fit, as long as they're not hurting anybody else. Um, but also on the other side, people are like, that's cool for you, 
but don't try to force me into whatever it, your lifestyle, your thing is, as long as I can respect what you do, as long as you respect my values. I feel like there's conversations being had in the black community because it's like, it used to be like, it used to be on some, you black, you black. But now, and I don't know how it is in the Asian community, but now I feel like there's like, people are, are kind of getting into their own different tribes a little bit. Like in the sense of just like, well, we're found foundationally black, meaning like our ancestors were brought here as slaves. So mm. we like, this is our black. And then you might have a, like, well, we're from Trinidad. Well, we're from the islands. So we over here. So we from Ghana. Oh, we from Ghana. Mm. We from Nigeria. So it's like, it's less just we're all black people. And now it's more everybody kind of in more their than own 90s? tribe. The, we're all just black yeah or even i like feel like it was it, at least the way i grew up but then again like i said i grew up in ohio in the midwest so it really was just mostly african-americans but i feel like that conversation of just everybody just repping their own set do you yeah. feel like is it and this, this might be like i'm speaking from complete ignorance right mm -hmm. Is it a thing of just like, if you're Korean, you're Korean. If you're Japanese, you're Japanese. Like, do y'all, is is there a complete sense of like unity as far right, as just I'll, like I'll where are? I think generally Chinese tend to be a little bit more Pan-Asian. And mm -hmm. because there's sort of Chinese history and Chinese bloodlines in yeah. like every Asian country. Yeah. But I could totally respect and understand why other Asian countries that are smaller want a little bit more of that exclusive yeah. representation yeah, yeah yeah so it's almost like depending on which one you were born gotcha. do you know what i'm saying gotcha. like, yeah, like, yeah, cause, yeah, cause yeah. chinese everybody's like well everybody already considers everybody chinese and it was like very influential in an ancient sense yeah to the whole zone yeah and then but then at the same time some people they want to move away from that in the modern day which i totally get too yeah yeah so it's to your point where i'm like ah oh, man i don't should we unite to have power in America, but that's not how people are orientated to like structure their whole life right, to right. build power. Exactly. They're like just trying to live their life They're in trying their to best live. like identity possible for themselves exactly. and how they view their fishbowls of life. Yeah. And not everybody's like super power centric. All right, you guys, we're wrapping up here at Pig and Butter. What was your favorite thing, man? Man, I can't even pick, bro. I've been I've been going ham on this orange chicken and uh and the waffles, but like the French toast. My yes. God. The French toast, for me, the cornbread pancake Corn, sandwich. Cornbread pancakes. Yo, come on, yo. Um, you talk a lot about the 90s yeah. in your work, right? And it, I was just thinking about this because I, I would generally agree with you that like, it seems like the art was better, the hip hop was better, even the, you know, you, you talk about, I have a lot of jokes about TGIF. Yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. You know what I mean? Like, My friend orders a $500 bottle of champagne. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever ordered a $500 bottle of champagne. Or if you've ever seen someone order a $500 bottle of champagne. Or if you've ever watched a rap video before. <laughs> but when somebody orders a $500 bottle of champagne, things get crazy, right? First of all, four of the most beautiful women you will ever see in your life appear out of nowhere, right? They're holding the bottle in their hands. Now, the bottle has 4th of July sparklers shooting out of the bottle, right? They parade the bottle through the club. Now, everyone in the club is focused on this bottle. And everyone simultaneously says to themselves, oh my God, who bought the $500 bottle of champagne? Then they place the bottle at the table and now the person who ordered the bottle has to sit there and act like he didn't know this parade was about to take place when he ordered this bottle, right? My friend and I are standing there, we're having a good time, but then he starts to tease me a little bit. He's like, yeah, I'm balling. I'm living life. I know you wish you was balling like me. Like, can I go into a hip hop club, order a $500 bottle of champagne, have four beautiful women bring it out while it's on fire and have everybody in the room go, oh my God, who ordered the $500 bottle of champagne? No. <laughs> but what I can do is go into a TGI Fridays, order the sizzling fajitas and get the same reaction from everybody in the restaurant. It's the same. How come it seemed like everything was better, but then I was looking up the racial statistics of that time yeah. and it was like, America was 85% white it was 10% black and literally everybody else made up 5% of America. Yeah. Obviously now the stats are way different in 2024. Is that weird that for people to be like, that was the best, but then it was like, it was so white then, but it seemed like, it felt like the minority stuff was maybe even more minority, I don't know. I think it's, some, it's similar to what we talked about earlier where during that time it was like either pre-internet or the internet was there, but it wasn't like social, it was pre-social media. So it wasn't like a lot of the it, you know, this online fighting and cancel culture and like that whole thing just wasn't around back then. 
So we could actually, you actually had to be present in your community or in your home or with your friends or with your family and actually take in, you know, take in life for what it was. But it also is just like a simpler, a simpler time where things moved a little bit slower. And I feel like even though we long for, uh, you know, world moving faster back then with like the future and what was going to be in the future. Now that we're like in the future of then, we kind of like, you know what, we could slow this down a little bit because things are kind of getting crazy right now. All right, we're walking over to actually uh, Pig and Butter's other spot yeah. in Alphabet City. I'm pretty excited to do that. But um, what I was going to say is like, what do you see right now? There's a lot of like articles coming out about how, I guess, the black electorate or mm -hmm. black voters, they're more moving towards Trump or they're, they're just dissatisfied with Biden. What, what do you see there? Yeah, I feel like it's more the latter. It's more like, Dis, uh, dissatisfied with Biden and dissatisfied with the Democratic Party. But then when it comes down to actually passing like bills and laws and doing things to actually help the black community, then they they be like ghosts, you know what I mean? Right. Where's all this money coming from when we ask for certain things that are of a financial Well, we sense. just don't have the funds. Whoa, we really? can't locate them. We don't, I don't know, know how, I don't, where no. we are. Oh, oh but my you God. Need, you need six trillion to fight this thing over here? Exactly. Here you, go. here you go. It's like it's like they playing in your face for a certain amount of time. You're like, all right, y'all playing with us? Okay, cool, this is what we gonna do. So that's where a lot of black people are right now. Right, right. All right, so we're on to the second location of Pig and Butter, but real quick, we just walked by a boba shop. Charles, have you ever had boba before? I've never had it. But you know what it is. I, uh, you know what bubble tea is. Yeah, yeah, bubble tea, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, you had bubble tea? I've had bubble tea, but I've never had, what is boba. it, bo boba? Bo boba is just another word for bubble tea, but you okay. know what it's right. still is? It, I'm learning something. It, but it's more like advanced than bubble tea in a way, if you, if you have regular bubble tea. All right, you guys, this is Charles McBee's first time having the pearls. <laughs> the tapioca pearls. You had bubble tea though. I had bubble tea, but but not with the bubbles. Not with the bubbles. So so we gonna we gonna rock it out. Oh yeah, that's good. What do you think? That's good. That's fire. Yeah, it's like something to chew on. Black Are on you? too, right? What? Black on? I I don't think so. You know, no, not, not, not. Spot. <laughs> You know what? Just a black yeah. person working there. You know, you know what though? Uh, Donald Glover, Childish Gambino does have a bubble spot in L.A. Oh yeah. Yeah. Dope. Because you know he's he an Asian girl. <laughs> <laughs> like a lot. Like, he really likes it. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> uh, we were talking about how, like, you know, people kind of use different coded language to get around maybe direct reparations to foundational Black Americans, right? right? Like, what, what is, what, like, I guess, what is that? Well, how people try to, you know, I, um, I remember when Biden was running, and a lot of the, um, yeah, a lot of Black people on his on his team one night, and they was like going out and saying he's going to do this for Black people, he's going to do that for Black people, right? And they came out with a whole, literally, plan for Black America. Like, they had their whole thing. The it first was, election. The first election. And they were like, you can go to our website, and you can read it for yourself. It's there. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go and read this. But then when you would read the actual fine print, it was like, we're going to uh, help poor people, you know, by investing in minority communities. And it was just like nothing that said specifically black or African-American people. It was just like poor people or, but in bold, they'd be like, here's how we're gonna help black people in this way. And then you would read it and they'd be like, so we're going to do this for diverse businesses and communities. And so it's a lot of coded language that's just like, you're, you're playing, it's like you're playing in our face a little bit. It's just like, we, we want, to hear something that's specifically, what are you specifically going to do for us as, as a community? As a, Don't just say, well, we're gonna do this for criminals. This is like, what the, what right. the hell? It, the, the, there's a definitely mainstream type of media narrative that, you know, black people are all poor, busted, broke, struggling, and it gets kind of like celebrated and funded too, so that it, it becomes this narrative and then you become synonymous with like black men in prison or black women on welfare. It's like literally that's how that shit gets started where the most people that are on welfare are white people because there's more white people. But it's just like, but we get all of a sudden become the face of these things, which is not, is not us. There's a whole, there's a bigger system that plays into that and actually feeds that. Media is big, like people don't understand how important representation and imagery is like it really feeds people's perception of what of who you are as a person before they even meet you right 
All right, you guys, we've made it to Alphabet City. It was quite the walk, quite the uh, characters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be a little more aware of what's good. That's a great thing about New York. You don't know what the hell's going on around it. Um, I guess, you know, we we're talking about the perception from the media that has been uh, pushed that way, whether it's intentionally, unintentionally, probably both. Yeah. I guess, do you feel like in the same way, because I, I grew up with a lot of middle-class black people, both parents, parents are working professionals, but yeah. sometimes even my friends would feel that pressure to adapt to like the national perception. Yeah, yeah, totally. Even though even though that wasn't necessarily reflective of their families, but right. maybe, maybe a cousin or a second cousin more, I guess was like fitting that archetype. Yeah. But then they almost want to adapt to their cousin. Yeah, if you, I mean, when you're trying to like make it, you know, in a dominant society that's not, when you're in a room that's uh, with people that looks more different than you than actually you, then you're just naturally going to kind of fit into that environment a little bit. You're going to kind of go, well, I'm trying to be upwardly mobile. And so you're naturally like some of your, you know, you're naturally going to cold switch, if you will. But I don't think that's necessarily a person selling out. I think that's just, you just adapting a little bit to your environment. Another thing with social media, you find in these pockets of like black people who are going out of the way to make it okay to identify with certain things that we normally wouldn't identify with. So it's just like black people that ski, like there's a whole group that goes, you know, like a whole weekend is like black people ski weekend right. where you go and skiing or you go, you know, black people love that swim. Like all these um, stereotypes that people think that we don't do or not into you're finding like these groups are coming together and being like, nah, we actually into this too. I mean, I think you just kind of have to be unapologetically you and also exposure. It's just exposing people to a, to some new shit. So sometimes people rebel against or sometimes people like uh, try to, they're afraid of what they don't know. And because they've never been outside, the, outside of their block or outside of their city or outside of their own circle or their own bubble, then they kind of like, you know, they look down upon it. But if you kind of expose people to certain things, be like, yo, this kind of lit over here. Like, come come check this out. Like, more people, more people are just, you know, be on board with it. For sure, for I think sure. that's the, that's like, that's the thing. It's just like a lot of kids, a lot of kids grow up, especially like from where I'm from, they grow up not even knowing what's, what's even out there. Like, they don't know, you don't know what you don't know. So you can only go by stereotypes and shit like that. All right, you guys, we're about to link up with Chef Sherry again. This is our second spot, yep. making butter. Just opened up. It's a bar. Let's do it. So I don't know <laughs> if you try to get a link. Could you give us a quick breakdown? So it's a pig and butter bar um, with elevated bar food, uh, signature cocktails. Um, we have some flaming going on with rosemary. Um, we have a special gin and tonic section with like a purple gin. Um, we have some sweet and smoky flavors for our cocktails. And then for the food, um, we have a truffle honey pancake, Korean short ribs and grits, Korean short ribs and fries, um, a Spanish tuna pizza. We even incorporate some Thai flavors, like a Thai mushroom tostada. Um, we have we have everything here. We gotta try it. It looks delicious. Thank you. All right, you guys, our final <laughs> section of this video is here at uh, Pig and Butter Bar, Alphabet City. Yeah. Yo, this is crazy. They this got the Bloody Mary. This is a whole meal though. Yeah, this, yeah, I'm about to say this this is definitely a black but bloody Mary. Cause right. they gonna give you a little bit of everything. They give you Thanksgiving dinner, they give you they give you bacon, they give you the olive, the deviled egg. Right, right, right. Well we'll see what drink they give you. Oh my god. Oh uh, but yeah. real quick, you know, we're here. This is the final part of the video we gotta talk about. I guess what do you think the relations are? And this is a big question, right? Because yeah. a lot of people would even debate if this question is a legitimate question. What is the relationship between the Black American community and the Asian American community? Yeah, in your view, it's a couple of different conversations I, I, I see from afar, kind of happening. Um, there was well, one. I think there's a there is a mutual respect. There's conversations of just like a mutual respect there, because I mean, going back, I, like I, I talk about the '90s and all that. So we grew up. You know, Wu Tang is obviously having his influence. We grew up watching, you know, karate films and, and, and being, you know, influenced by like the Bruce Lee's and, and, and all of that. Right, Jet Li, ja Jackie Jet Chan. Lee, Jackie Chan, like that whole thing was like, we, we was heavy into that. I felt like there was a narrative of like, it was like black people versus Asians. I was like, where did that even come from? I'm just looking at it 
I'm looking at it like, are these trolls? Are these bots? Is it real? Is it not real? Like, what's the? I didn't understand where that narrative or why why it was kind of like being kind of uh, you know pushed in that direction. There's definitely certain parts of the community where it's like they're not getting along, but like you said, like people in comedy or in an industry or in a field, yeah, that's like a whole different segment of person where that. Yeah, I feel like almost like being a comic is transcending. Yeah, sort of sense of tribalism. Yeah, but I I know like the more blue collar more salt of the earth people from each community may not be getting along yeah or may have more extreme perceptions of each other than right people who are educated people with a similar mindset thinking on the same geometric plane also if you go to any like black communities like there's asians in those black communities like co-excited co right. like there's a, 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 there's a, a food spot there's a food spot there's an asian food spot there's a chinese food spot there in those black communities like for, there's a long history. I guess it's, it's both. There's a long history of us coinciding together. But there's also a long history of there being tension in those communities because in the whole sense of like, oh, what? Oh my goodness. Is, is this more your speed? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pinky's up. Hey. <laughs> I don't know. It was on there. All right. We're doing it. My goodness. Oh boy. Two lunches. Uh, we starting off, we got uh, truffle deviled eggs. This is cha shu Cantonese roast pork with gochujang and a fried egg. These are coquito whipped crepes. The the whip is made out of coquito, which is like a Puerto Rican, Dominican, like liquor, right? Yeah. And uh, over here, we got Korean short rib with grits. And I believe, what, smoked salmon pastrami, right? Yeah, go for it. Uh, shout out to pig and butter. Shout out to pig and butter, man. I'm gonna get a, go in on these uh, coquito with crepes. Woo. Oh, bro, that's crazy. You know, oftentimes I wish like people from different communities could have this like unique experience that I'm sure you had that yeah. I had growing up. Like, obviously, uh, I played sports. I played basketball, football, track. Um, there was uh, black students in my honors class. Shout out to Nicole Sharper, she's Jamaican. Like, I had so many different experiences sharing things with other people. Obviously, being in entertainment, right? As a in media, as a career, right? I've been able to meet so many different types of people and connect with so many people. For example, obviously, I'm Asian, Asian American, connecting with like African Americans, but also people from the Caribbean, people from Africa, people from all around the world, Belize. Yeah. And it's like, but I just know that a lot of people, regardless of whatever community, they don't necessarily have that right. opportunity yeah. right, to be so worldly or like cultured or meet so many people across the spectrum. Exactly. That's why um, a lot of times people just go on based off of stereotypes that they know from media or from online or social media or whatever, because they don't have that one-on-one -on -one personal connection where they're like, oh no, that's not... Uh, uh, you can't base a person or a community on stereotypes that you've heard. You got to actually like know somebody and really have that conversation. Um, and that and, and it helps so that when you hear someone else talk negatively about that community or about a certain person, you'd be like, nah, it's not really like that because my homeboy is Chinese and I'm with his family all the time and this is how we get down over it. Like you, get, you can able to combat that, but if all you hear is these negative stereotypes and you don't have any personal connections to combat it where you just go oh it must be true and it seems like for people who don't work in really like diverse fields where everybody's like not just visually aesthetically genetically diverse but actually like putting themselves out there yeah. and and talking about the differences i guess the only other time where i see people like from very disparate backgrounds get on the same page is like in the military or something yeah. like that like we all become like police officers or of course, that's going to put us in a situation where we all right. got to have each other's back. Right. You're just blue at that point. I have a joke where I say you got to hang around people that's different than you. You can have your people that's obviously in your community. You got to hang around people that's not like you and not and from a whole different background perspective. It just not only not just because it's like politically correct. It just keeps you from saying and doing stupid shit. You know what I mean? Right. Keeps you from sounding like an asshole sometimes, sounding ignorant. There was a test that they used to do with kindergartners where it was just like you had the blue eyed people over here and the green eyed people over here and they would like give the blue eyed people a little bit extra uh, free time or a little bit extra snacks and saw how 
they interacted with each other and it was always just like it became very tribal and, and the green eyed people became you know hatred of the blue it was just like we find little you could be all white blonde hair blue eyed culture and it'd still be like yeah but your hair is this lean my hair is that lean or your you know you're this tall and we're this tall it's gonna be something that human beings find to beef about right like i know in england especially at a time where england was completely white they used to go off accent yeah like, oh you're from you're from north london exactly. i'm from south london you have the birmingham accent exactly hey man this was a great discussion the food was amazing what, what was your favorite thing out of here you, you got to try that real I'm, quick. Get, I'm getting in on this i honestly i'm gonna go ahead and say that this uh chashu cantonese roast pork with the gochujang and the fried egg this was the one for me. That's what's up, man. I'm, I'm in on this grits. You you can't put a plate of grits in front of me and and I don't go in on it. So it's like ribs and grits mixed together with the sauce. I never even knew I needed this combination. I did not know I needed this combination until just now. But. Well, hey man, this was a great discussion. Yo, Charles, man. Where, where else can they find you and what uh, can they look forward to? Everything, Charles McBee, um, you know, C, uh, MC, B as in boy, E, Charles McBee. YouTube, uh, TikTok, Instagram, everything is the same at Charles Um, You know, if you're in New York City, come see me do stand up, man. Pull up. Hell yeah. All right, you guys, until next time, we out. Peace. Peace.